In part two of Kimberley Adventure, Malcolm fished for the mighty Barramundi in the northeast Kimberley, battled high seas to reach the horizontal waterfall in Talbot Bay, found turtles nesting on the Lassipede Islands, watched a kilometre long waterfall rise from the sea as the tide dropped, rescued dying turtles, and tangled with the extraordinary tides. Always at home in the isolation of the Kimberley, he settles the boat on a dropping tide, knowing that this is a great place to get a feed. In comes a mangrove jack. And then a Norwest snapper. This time it's something really big. Oh. A nice trevally, but it will be released. The jack and the snapper are enough for the midday meal. It's a rough place to camp, but there are no sandy beaches on this stretch of the coast. Fresh fish cooked in mangoes and coconut milk is superb. What are you guys? Come and get it! Take a couple of bits of fish I see down there. Okay. On the rising tide, they have an unwelcome visitor, a saltwater crocodile. It's obvious that it's never been shot at and it won't be hunted away. What do you want? Go on, back off. Go on, give me that hand. Go on, go on. That was a little bit scary. Just had a beautiful feed, just went down to the water to wash my uh, plate and that croc, which is still behind me, eyeing me off, just turned up a couple of metres from me. A lot of people try and tell me that you can only get crocs where there's mangroves and mud, but not where there's reef, and that's totally wrong. Where you get these big tides and strong currents, you get these crocs, like this one behind me, that travel huge distances on the rise and fall of tide. I call them drifters because they drift and as soon as there's any sort of activity, they move in. I'll just show you what you can do with these animals and how careful you've got to be. I've got a bit of fish here, and I'm gonna go down and bring him in, and I'll feed him that fish, and he's a totally wild animal, probably never seen humans before. I'm just trying to emphasize here how careful you've got to be in crocodile country. Malcolm demonstrates how aggressive it can be at three metres, it's big enough to take a human. With eyes wide open and jaws slightly ajar, it's poised to attack. well away from the croc to camp for the night.
when you're on a long trip on a boat, you often run out of the conventional lure, the silver one or the red one, and you've got to make up lures. Now, years ago, a lot of you saw me make a lure out of the sunshine milk tin lid, this little silver section. Well, that makes a, an excellent lure, and I'll make one out of that in a minute. And also, the Milo lid makes a smaller lure, makes a good lure too. I've just had a look around the boat, and I've picked up all sorts of bits and pieces. A bit of orange rope will make an excellent lure. Yellow rope. Uh, a little bit of white plastic. Now that makes a really great lure. Just twist it together, and you've got yourself a nice squid. Uh, what else we got here? Oh look, here's a bit of red and white rag. That'll work well. A bit of red material. That is excellent. A uh, bit of white plastic and a bit of scungy old rope. That'll work well too. There's a good lure. Off-white bit of rag and uh, another bit of plastic. So we've got lots and lots of lures here. So I'll just make up a few and uh, we'll go and try them out. All I'm doing here is just wrapping a little piece of plastic around the hook and just binding it on with a bit of wire. And I'll just uh, sliver that a little bit. Right, that one looks pretty right. The next one will be the, uh, the bit of aluminium foil. So it's pretty simple, just a matter of wrapping it around the, the hook a few times. There we are, squash it on and you can uh, shape it down so it looks like a little minnow, like a little silver fish. And uh, I'll, I'll just bind some wire on that. That looks pretty good. We'll try some uh, orange rope now. Have to split it up into three or four pieces. I've got three pieces here now, smaller pieces. I'll put them together. Bend it in half, and uh, I'll shorten that down. Fray them up a little bit. When they go through the water, they get nice and loose. And uh, right now, I'll stick a hook in there. Right, we just put, I might even put a double hook. Yeah, double hook. Right, a bit of wire. And just tie that on. Like so. Out in the bush here, you don't want to be mucking around making lures. I don't anyway. I'd much rather be catching the fish and eating the fish than making the lures. But these look pretty rough, but I tell you what, they work very well. Just tie that on there. Just Now what I do is I take the end of the wire and just pop it through the eye there. So that'll stop it from slipping down. Just pop it through there. Take the other one through the eye the other way. Pull it through. Now all I have to do is twitch those together. These only have to last for one fish. As long as I get a feed, that's all I ask. What do you reckon? An orange squid or an octopus? Right, I could go in here all day. So I'll make up a few more and, uh, and we'll go and try them. Yeah, well they all look pretty good. So, um, oh, I've got one more to show you. Here, it's an old, oh, what is it? Old 303 spent shell, an empty shell. Very old and corroded, it doesn't look very exciting now, but if I clean that up and get a bit of colour to it, and clean it up, see how bright it is now? Tom jams the hooks inside the shell. There we are. Right, oh, that's ready to catch a fish. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Yep.
When the tide's high through the mangroves, it's time to give the homemade lures a test run. I've got the old uh, cartridge on one line there. I've got the, the very upmarket lure, the little bit of plastic, white plastic bag. And the third one we're going to try is the white rag and the red rag. Just go for a trial and I'll show you how good they work. Well, there we are. Now that is the, uh, that's the little, yeah, we're just checking. That's the uh, little 303 bullet. So it just goes to show. There we are, see? Right now, keep this one for tea and I'll try one of the other lures. Okay. Right up, Tom. Just, just around this thing. Up! Come on. <laughs> there we are. One mouthful of red and white rag and it's a beautiful fish so it just goes to show that you don't have to buy very expensive lures if you use the right color and the right speed for valleys you always trawl very quickly if they come around and they're not going for the lure trawl a lot faster and uh, you'll always get them well it's a nice fish but we've already got one so i'll let it go Orange and yellow raffia excites the fish. Right, oh, there's the evidence. A couple of minutes and uh, another nice trevally. Got a very tiny hook on here. It won't hurt the fish. Jeez. Just, there we are. Hey, look at it, but it's uh, very effective. Pop him back in the water. Ah. I've just hooked another one on the red and white little piece of rag and just down here in front of me there were just hundreds of trevally about this big if you just go around now you might be able to see them there in the water look look at them <laughs> hey. oh. Oh. i just lost just just bit the trace you can see them out here now they're just in a feeding frenzy Fishing up here is just amazing. Right, uh, here I have my very special lure, about two cents worth or less of white paper bag. So we just put that on the on the swivel and uh, throw it over. Right, uh, Tom. Thanks, man. Within seconds, the fish lunge at the plastic. Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Hey, boy. Put him back in the water. A minute. Look at that. <laughs> That's not a bad fish for a. And I caught that on a uh, a little piece of plastic bag. Oh, how's that? Oh, undamaged, back in the water. See you later, mate. When we're in the boat for a 
long period of time are eating fish almost nightly and a lot of it's trevally. It's not a bad fish but it's not the best eating fish that we can catch. So every now and then when we've got a bit of time we come ashore early, we cook up a real gourmet meal. Now I know I'm pretty rough in the bush but occasionally I do carry the aluminium foil and so we lie that out there and put a, another smaller piece down here and I'll put a couple of fish in on the foil. One there and one there. Right on. Wendy, how about you moving off for a while? Right on. Freshly caught for valley. It's got to be cooked within hours of catching it, otherwise it'll dry out. Now I've been carrying with me some coconut milk for quite a while. So I'm going to put the coconut milk in and some sliced mangoes. Stuff it with sliced mangoes. Get out of it, dog. A little bit of curry powder and a Kimberley onion. That's what, how we grow onions in the Kimberley. It's big and it's not a sour onion. It's very sweet, so it'll add to the flavour of the mangoes. Sounds like a weird combination, but it's going to be beautiful. The sliced mango goes inside. There we are. Oh, this, whoops. Beautiful, this. And the juice on top. And the onion just goes all over it, like so. And inside, I use whatever I've got in the boat. I just happen to still have an onion. And of course, the coconut milk, well, always carry the coconut milk. Now that goes all over the fish. There we are. Got all of it. Now before I lose it, I'll wrap it all up. I'll wrap it up. When it's all wrapped up, go straight on the coals. How is that? Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I was a bit short of foil and I got a touch of sand in on the back here. Just get rid of that. And we'll have a look inside. Oh now it is just breaking away and it is beautiful, sweet juicy meat. Mm. Over 800 islands lie off the Kimberley coast. Dismissed by the early explorers as worthless obstacles of sand and rock, their strange haunting surrealism is so different from other coastal scenes. On these barren islands, a pocket of lush vegetation signals fresh water. In such a hot, remote place, Malcolm's always looking to replenish his supplies. Uh -huh, look. This is another sign that there's usually water nearby. This is the Australian native fig tree. And I've got a green ant biting me. There he is. He's also a good tucker. Mmm. Mmm, that's nice. 
Now, the Australian fig, what happens is that the seed-eating birds eat the figs, very sweet, very nice. They come in near the water and they pass these seeds and of course they grow around near, the, uh, near these water holes. Just before I go and check in the freshwater mangroves here for water, I'm going to have a bit of a feed. Whoops, nearly fell down. In another couple of weeks, this whole tree would be covered in, uh, in red fruit. Just got a couple here, and I'm getting down very quickly because all over me are green ants. Cheers. These are the green ants that I was talking about that you can eat. Oh, wow. Hundreds of them all over me. Oh, bit of a payback here. I'll eat the, the rear end of some of these. The abdomen contains acidic juices. The tart flavor, a thirst quencher, like sherbet. I was just about to show you earlier when I was rudely interrupted by those green ants attacking me the ripe fruit. Here's one here, and around it are all the green ants. Mm. I've come in through the mangroves and I found this water here, but it's, it's brackish after the very big tides we've been having for a while. Behind here, though, it's still very green. So if I go back into that grass, there's a good chance that I'll find fresh water above high tide mark. Right back inside is a small puddle seeping out of the rock. Beautiful spring water. Mm. So once again, with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of perseverance, we've got beautiful water. I've just come in and anchored very close to this reef. The tide's going to rise, and in a few minutes, big schools of trevally should come in along the edge here, waiting to go over the reef to feed into the mangroves. Just for a few minutes, the fishing is usually fantastic. So just wait. And just as that water peaks and goes over the reef, the fish will come on. Within a few minutes, the wind came up. So the next morning, they're back again. The water's glassy calm and fish are schooling below. There we are. Sit down, dog. Nice fish. Only a couple of inches of water. Must have been the change of hat. This is my lucky hat.
On the high tide, pelagic fish browse near the mangroves, and here the fishing is excellent. Good dog, good dog. Packs of black tip reef sharks arrive and Malcolm tries to film them with a small underwater Super 8 camera. He's trying to record their reaction to a piece of fish tied to the stern. But he's not having much luck. Come on, hey, back. Black-tip reef sharks are not usually aggressive towards humans, but they become agitated when there's blood or food in the water. The sharks are more interested in the camera when it's immersed in the water. Malcolm, a left-hander, films with his right hand in case he's bitten. The huge tides restlessly build and ebb every six hours, and the currents teem with fish. fish are feeding on very small bait fish. That's why all the birds are diving all around the boat. We tried bigger lures, we didn't do any good. So what I did was made up a very small, rather primitive wet fly out of a little bit of a white feather that I found on the beach and a little bit of silver foil. Worked beautifully. This frantic feeding activity takes place every day on the dropping tide. just caught him. Did you notice he just spat the lure out then? So that's what I caught him on. A very small silver lure. These birds are feeding on very small fish. Big lures are no good. Got to use a little lure. Right out very late in the afternoon so just go and have another trial amongst the birds just before we go home and cook that fish on the beach. Yeah. Known as the mirror fish oh, because of its beautiful reflected colours, this species is rarely caught in the waters of the northwest. By sunup, Malcolm's on his way again, heading for Walcott Inlet. At a rocky outcrop in Collier Bay, he checks a small cave 
just above the high tide mark. This is the final resting place of the last seafaring Aborigines from Montgomery Reef. Malcolm's always concerned that the bones might be desecrated or stolen, but all's well. There's been no recent disturbance. cliffs dominate much of the Kimberley coastline. But at the entrance to Doubtful Bay, just above the waterline, grows a small rainforest thicket. People often ask me how you find water on an isolated coast like the Kimberley. Well, it's often very difficult, but there are a number of signs. One, of course, are the seed-eating birds like the rock pigeons and corallas and cockatoos. They always come into water. Another one behind me is a remnant rainforest. Now, this is the end of the dry season now, but that rainforest and those trees are very rich, very green, so they've got their roots down in the water. When we came along the coast, I noticed those trees. So we've come in here and we found water. Now where I'm sitting is about five metres under the sea at high tide. So I can only find this water at low tide. Just below me. That's very sweet, that's spring water, beautiful water. So if you are going along the coast in a boat and you see these rich little clumps of rainforest, often below a cliff line like this one is, it indicates that the water table runs out somewhere on the sand or amongst the rocks. And remember, quite often you can only find that water at low tide. Mm. Boon, come and have a drink. Come on. Lovely water. Here. Here. Drink. Here. Here. Come here. Here. Drink. Here. Beautiful. Here. Oh, lovely. No, not my cup. Here, out of my hand. Nice, eh? Oh, fresh water. Steep Island towers out of the sea at the entrance to Doubtful Bay. Nearby is a special place where the spirit guardians watch over the coast. Known as Wanjinas, these mythological beings have power over the country and the seasons. Wanjinas are found throughout the Western Kimberley. Their secret haunts have distinctive names. This is Narmalali. Around the Wanjinas are paintings of their exploits and the fish they caught. Once the Aborigines came every year at the beginning of the wet to repaint the images, restoring their power according to age-old custom. This ritual is no longer performed and the Wanjinas will eventually fade and disappear. In the late afternoon, the Kimberley sandstone gleams gold. Malcolm, a keen photographer, catches the magic light on his Olympus camera. As the shadows lengthen, the colours soften to pastel. A 
A day later, and further north along the coast, the men enter a small bay at Langi, an area rich in Aboriginal mythology. When Wanjinas roamed this land, they met here at Langi, and a ferocious battle was fought. The rocks represent those warriors felled in the conflict. After the usual wait a while, the men motor into Walcott Inlet and up to where the salt water meets the fresh. few places anywhere as tranquil as this. the men always need fresh fish and this is a good spot for sooty grunter. Now these are the, the Kimberley sooty grunter, or most people call them a black brim. They're not a very exciting fish, but they're beautiful to eat. You can fry them, grill them, put them in the coals, and I've even boiled them and made a soup out of them, very nice. Now we've got a fair way to walk back to the boat, so what I've got is just a stick here, you see, like a V, and a longer section here for holding, and a shorter one here to thread the fish on. All I do is just pop it up through the gills and the mouth and it's a very good way to carry a fish back to the boat or back to camp. Oops. Right, I'll just pop it on there. Come on. At low tide in the upper reaches of the inlet, only a few water holes can be found. It's impossible to travel, but this is a great place to drop a line. So Malcolm and Tom go after threadfin salmon. Young whaler shark is not Malcolm's favourite meal. Now 
Now this is what we have been after. In the cool times, when these fish are fat, they would be the best eating fish in the north. I would rate these threadfin salmon even higher than the mighty barramundi. That is a beautiful eating fish. And you're gonna get a little bit, but just leave it alone, right? Leave him alone. As I was saying, that's probably one of the best eating fish you'll get in the north. Threadfin salmon, because he's got the, the whiskers underneath here. See the little whiskers? This bigger fish is a good-sized barramundi. Now, if you're going to handle these fish, don't pick them up by the gills, and I've been the worst offender for that for many years. If you want to release the fish, well, pick it up underneath with a bag like this and hold it so you don't damage the fish. You can take your photograph, do it your life, and then you can release the fish again. The men will just have time to cook a feed before the tide comes back up the inlet. It arrives with extraordinary speed. Within seconds, the sand flats are alive with a living, leaping spread of millions of pop-eyed jumping mullet. Salmon, barramundi and sharks swim below, feasting on the shimmering mass. As the tide recedes, the men head for the open sea and on to Broome. With the arrival of the wet season, it will be a busy time trapping crocs and collecting eggs. Watch for Malcolm Douglas's next adventure, Living with Crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> 